Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. And if you're listening to this message and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first thing that you must do is repent and believe the gospel. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. Okay, so God wants to reason with you. Okay, he wants to reason with you. He says, though our sins be red as scarlet, okay, though our sins be red as crimson, hallelujah, yet shall the blood of Jesus Christ wash them whiter than snow. You see, as far as the east is from the west, so far will he remove our transgressions from us when we come to him by faith. And the reason why he uses so far as the east is from the west is because if you keep on going east, you'll always go east. And if you keep on going west, you'll always be heading west. East and west do not meet together. Therefore, when you come to Jesus Christ, your sins will be wiped away, no longer remembered by him because he will throw them into the sea. Okay, the sea of forgetfulness because the blood of Jesus will be your covering. And when he sees you, he will not see your sin, but he will see Christ in you, the hope of glory. He will see his perfect righteousness, which is credited to you. Okay, there's nothing that we can add to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. You see, because when God was on that cross, yes, God, I said God, hallelujah, because Jesus Christ is God. The Bible says that God was in Christ on that cross not counting our sins against us, but he was reconciling the world unto himself. That means that when Jesus Christ sees you, he will see himself because we are born again, hallelujah, born again by faith in his name, and therefore the Holy Spirit will come inside of you, hallelujah, and he will make you into that new creation, and the Holy Spirit will be your seal until the day of redemption. And so when Christ looks at you, no longer will he see you as a sinner, but he will see you as a saint. That's why the Bible calls him the king of saints. Hallelujah. And you are a saint when you come to him. Okay, when you come to him by faith in his name, when you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says you are saved. Hallelujah. You are saved. My goodness, you can't add anything to what Jesus Christ has done. It is finished, he decried. Okay, on the cross with his last breath, he cried out, it is finished. You can't add anything to it. Okay, people always want to work. You can't work. Okay, there's no boasting. The Bible makes this so clear. There's no boasting in his presence. You can't say, hey, I did this, I did that. Okay. I did this in your name. I did that in your name. But did you believe? My goodness. The Bible says not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, okay, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And what is the will of the Father? That you believe on the one whom he has sent. Many people will say in that day, Lord, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not do this and that in your name? But they didn't say, did they believe? They didn't have faith. They were trusting in their works. Okay, that's Matthew chapter 7. Okay, let me just go there right quick because this is crucial. Hallelujah. I wasn't planning to go here, but evidently God is speaking to somebody right now about this very topic. And so let me go to Matthew chapter 7. Okay, because this is the most important thing. Okay, you got to get this right because if you don't get this right, you're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Guaranteed. Matthew chapter 7. Okay, what did he say in verse 21? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Okay, but where's faith at? 
Okay, did you believe on his name? Okay, where's the faith at? They're talking about, hey, I did this work. I prophesied in your name. I did this work, Lord. I cast out demons in your name. I did that work, Lord. I did many wonders in your name. I did all this work. But did you believe? Okay. Verse 23 says, no. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Where's boasting? Okay. Where is boasting? Okay, there's no glory in his sight. He shares his glory with no one. Who cares if you prophesied in his name? Who cares if you cast out demons in his name? Who cares if you did many wonders in his name? There's no boasting on that day. Okay. The only thing that we boast in is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That he saved us by his precious blood. That's all I got. What you got? Okay. All I have is Jesus Christ. I ain't got nothing else. Who cares if I did this, that, and the third in his name? Did you believe? Okay. Did you rest in the finished works of Jesus Christ? Did you believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead? Is your faith in that and that alone? That's it. That's all. No boasting, okay? No boasting, hallelujah. No boasting. You can't boast about your work. You cannot boast about your works. The Bible says even our righteousness are as filthy rags in his sight. There's no boasting in his name. Okay, there's no boasting in oh, what you've done and I did this, that, and the third in your name. No. The question is, do you believe in what he's done for you? Okay. Do you believe in what he has done for you? Do you believe that your sin has been forgiven? Do you believe that he's given you eternal life? Okay. Well, if you do confess that he is your Lord and Savior, believe it in your heart that he's risen from the dead. That's what you rest in. Hallelujah. That is the work that you do. Okay. That's the work that you do if you want to work the works of God. Nothing else will suffice. The only work that we can do is to believe. That's it. That's all. Okay. That's it. That's all. End of discussion. So if you want to you want to argue about that, well, go. <laughs> hey, you could you could argue until you blew in the face. God don't change. Okay. You could argue with me until the cows say moo. OK, you could argue with me until the cows go moo. You could argue with me until the cows go moo. <laughs> it ain't going to change the fact that Jesus Christ don't change. And that's what we're going to get into today. OK. This is the work that we must do if we want to work the works of God that we believe. That's his will. Okay, that's his will. That's the will of the Father, that you believe on the one whom he has sent. That's it. That's all. Anything else is boasting. That's why these people who want to work and want to rest in their work of what they've done, what I did, look at me. Hey, I'm high and mighty. Okay, well, God says, surely you've received your reward. <laughs> you've received your reward. Okay. You want to boast about doing this, about being some big hot shot? Okay, you've received your reward. And when you try to go into the presence of God on the last day, boasting about your work, well, the Bible's going to declare in the book of works what your works amount to. On the last day, the Bible's going to declare, okay, because the Bible is Jesus. He's the word of God. The word of God is going to declare your works because God is a record keeper. Hallelujah. And if your sins have not been expunged by his precious blood, the Bible says on the last day, the book of works is going to be open and that book will have your name in it. And everything that you've done, everything that you've said, everything that you thought, even the intents of the will of your heart will be laid bare. Okay. And everything that's offensive to God will be judged. Everything that has offended God will be judged. And the penalty is death. And guess what? Because you've already died. It's the last day. <laughs> You've already died and God has called you back up. Okay, get up now. Okay, so the last day you're already dead. Okay, you're already dead. Okay, dead in your sins and trespasses. You've already experienced the first death. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And if your name is in the book of works 
and your whole life story is in the book of work. Ooh! Now, you know God. He can't look at sin. So God has another punishment for you called the second death, which was your choice. Okay. You wanted to boast? You wanted to be high and mighty? Okay. You wanted to have a lofty look? You want to say, hey, look at me. I'm Mr. or Mrs. He-Man or She-Woman. Okay. I did this, that, and the third. And your name, Jesus. Ooh, look at my works. I did this, that, and the third. In your name, Jesus. Ooh, look at my works. I'm high and mighty. Okay. Well, hey. Your choice, your soul, your destiny. But if you want to rest, Jesus Christ says, come. If you want to rest, the spirit and the bride says, come. If you want to rest, let he or she who is hungry come. If you want to rest, let he or she who is thirsty come. That's how you rest. You come to Jesus and you believe. That's it. That's all. Born of a virgin. Hallelujah. God in the flesh. Hallelujah. Lived a sinless life. Hallelujah. Died a substitutionary atoning death for your sin. Hallelujah. And my sin. Hallelujah. Was buried in a borrowed tomb. Hallelujah. On the third day, got up with all power because the grave could not hold him down. Hallelujah. Okay. Bodily ascended back to heaven. Hallelujah. One day soon and very soon coming on the cloudy and dark day to get his church. Hallelujah. And then seven years later, uh, heaven will open and he will come on a white horse to establish the rule of the kingdom for a thousand years. Hallelujah. And after the thousand years are finished, he will dissolve uh, the heavens and the earth with a fervent heat. And on the last day, the only thing that will remain is a great white throne. Hallelujah. And on that day, sheep on the right, goats on the left. Hallelujah. Okay. Last day, where you going to be now? Is your name going to be written? In the Lamb's Book of Life, or is your name going to be found in the Book of Works? That's your choice. And the Bible says his sheep hear his voice, and he knows us, and we follow him. All of his belong on the right, because that's where the sheep are. And the Bible says if you're his sheep, you'll hear his voice. So I pray that you'll come, because the time is short. And the days are evil. Therefore, come. Amen. Well, saints of God, I just want to get into this. God wanted me to go down that road for somebody out there. And I pray that you receive the message and that you receive Christ. But for all of us who are here, because God has led us to this teaching hour, I want to talk about the unchanging God. I want to talk about the unchanging God in the preface of this teaching. It is Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Okay, so this theme of God not changing is repeated uh, in various places in the Bible because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, God doesn't change. So you have to, we have to understand this fact. Okay, this is a fact. This is like, this is, this is, is this is black and white. This is a fact. Okay, so when you got the facts, hallelujah, we can look at the evidence and then we can see that God does not change. And so that's the whole premise, that God doesn't change. And so you've heard it said that the Old Testament conceals while the New Testament reveals. Well, I believe it goes both ways and that the New Testament also conceals and the Old Testament reveals. That's why we have to have the whole counsel of God. You see, because the only way to understand the book of Revelation, which is what we're going to talk about, which has stuff that is concealed, okay, until the time of the end, which is now, we have to go back to the Old Testament to get the revelation. 
We have to go back to the beginning because God tells us the end from the beginning. And so when we go back to the beginning and God doesn't change, he's going to act the same way that he did in the beginning at the end. Because as he says, I am the Lord, I do not change. And that's the whole point. And I believe that if we understood this concept at all times as the spirit of Christ dwells in us richly, I believe, O oh Lord, that you would continue to build us up, okay? Because we have a teachable spirit. And so I pray, oh Lord, for that teachable spirit so that you could build us up, Lord. That you could build us up in the faith and in the knowledge and in the understanding of who you are through your glorious wisdom. Through the manifold presence of the seven spirits of God which dwell in the church, the body of Christ, the golden candlestick, the menorah. And I pray that you would give us a fresh and a new anointing, O oh Lord, that you will pour out abundantly the Holy Spirit because you said we have not because we ask not. And so we ask according to your will because you said how much more would you give us the Holy Spirit if we ask? And so we need a fresh and a new anointing, a fresh and a new outpouring, a fresh and a new filling, the quickening, hallelujah. The quickening of the Ruach HaKodesh. Help us, Holy Spirit, to understand. Lead us and guide us into all truth because you do not change. So make that clear and abundant in this teaching so that someone out there, including me, would have a right understanding of your game plan because you've already told us the end from the beginning so that we could use this knowledge that you're going to give us in order to correct, rebuke, reprove, and exhort those who you bring into our presence with accurate revelation from uh, the Word of God itself. This is nothing but the Bible, okay? And so we thank you for your Word, which is truth. Sanctify us with your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I want to focus on the tabernacle, okay? Because that is what's about to happen. I've taught upon this numerous times, but it's always good to go over it again because there's still so much bad teaching out there that I just don't understand where people, you know, I don't understand it. I just don't get it. I just don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I just don't get it. But on this channel, we're going to see what God has to say, which has been my motto, which has been my call from God himself. Okay. My commission. Okay. My calling, hallelujah, that God gave me when I came uh, to him as a sinner in need of a savior. And he gave me new life in him. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And when he gave me my call, he told me that I was a preacher. Hallelujah. And I was to preach the gospel first, which is why I always lead off with the gospel. And then he told me my commission was to announce the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. And entailing the day of the Lord included uh, declaring the mystery of Babylon the Great, which we've done on this channel numerous occasions, and how terrible the dark and cloudy day is for those who were left behind while always emphasizing the rapture of the church. And so we know that the rapture is about to happen. And so God has given us how the rapture is going to take place when we go to the Old Testament to look at how the tabernacle was set up. Hallelujah. And so this is the key. I mean, I don't, I really, I, I, quite frankly, I've never seen anyone teach this. I haven't seen anyone teach this. And if you've seen somebody else teach this, please show them a video uh, so that I could see. But I never see anybody teaching about this tabernacle model and how it represents how the heavenly reality is going to be set up. Because God doesn't change. I, you see, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because uh, I'm about to get worked up. And I don't want to get worked up because I want to teach. Hallelujah. I don't want to preach. Okay. But I get worked up now. I get worked up. My goodness. Because it's, it's just like kind of flabbergasting. If I could put a word to it. And these are people who have, you know, uh, you know, Lots of knowledge, 
that I listen to, but I never hear them accurately describe this key ingredient, which is the tabernacle. Okay, and this is where we have to go. We have to go to the beginning to understand the end. It's imperative. And so when we go to this tabernacle model, the same way that God told Moses on the mount about this pattern, okay, of the heavenly reality, he said to Moses, make sure that you make everything according to the pattern that I showed you on the mount. And so this pattern, this model, this image is given by uh, the master builder himself, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Okay. He's the one who gave Moses the revelation of the heavenly reality. And he says it was a pattern. And God told Moses to make sure that he made everything according to the pattern. So what's a pattern? A pattern is a model. Okay. So the same model that Moses constructed on the earth represents the heavenly reality which is the true reality okay this is just like a simulation on this earth i mean this earth is just you know how it is it's crazy okay you talk about evil days and it's not even evil days my goodness and these people they done lost their ever loving mind okay and it's not even the dark and cloudy day yet i can't even imagine what it's going to be like in the dark and cloudy day okay bible says about that day whoo it shall be as if a man fled from a lion, and a bear met him. I went inside a house and leaned their hand on a wall, and a serpent bit him. Okay. You talk about the dark and cloudy day. Okay. And you see the way these people are today? You don't want to see that day. Okay. You don't want to see that day. And so God, and I don't want to see that day. Hallelujah. Okay, not left behind in the tribulation. No way. Okay, <laughs> as they say, no way, Jose. Okay, no way. Not left behind in the tribulation. Oh, no, I don't want to see it like that. <laughs> I don't want to see it like that. Not left behind uh, in the tribulation. And if I was left behind in the tribulation and I was in America, well, I'm dead. Okay, end of discussion. Left behind in the dark and cloudy day, you're dead. Right off top, if you live in America. Okay. Left behind in the dark and cloudy day in America, dead. Right off top. Okay. Don't pass go. Okay. <laughs> Don't pass go. Okay. Okay. Don't pass go. Woo! Because that red horse, ooh, he gonna have a field day in Babylon the Great. Ooh! And there go that pale horse right on his tail. Ooh, he getting out that fourth position. Ooh, he getting out that gate now. Ooh, there, there he go. There he go. Out the gate. Ooh, that pale horse. He getting out that gate. Okay, right on his behind. Ooh, he getting out that gate. Getting out that gate on Babylon the Great. Okay. And he got one fourth of the world to kill. Okay, so whatever's left in America after the rapture, okay, however many's left, dead. Okay, I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. It's the truth. Okay. The Bible says today, if you will hear his voice, today, if you will harden not your heart, people want to sugarcoat stuff. They want to, they want to, they want to, they want saccharine and sweet. Okay. They say, give me my cherry on top of that cupcake. And put some whipped cream on it too. Okay. But not on this channel. I'm not. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Okay. Woe is me if I declare not unto you the whole counsel of God. Can't sugarcoat the apocalypse. It's the apocalypse. Okay. Can't sugarcoat that. How you gonna sugarcoat that? Okay. Can't sugarcoat the apocalypse. Left behind in America, dead. Left behind in America, dead. My goodness. Okay. Bible says when the day of the Lord come and come like a thief in the night. Ooh, you got caught with your pants down, dead in America. Okay. The well-favored harlot. Okay. The lady of kingdoms who said that I will sit as a lady forever. 
There she goes, Statue of Liberty, right there in New York City. I shall sit as a lady forever. I will not know widowhood, neither shall I know the loss of children. Okay. I'm Babylon the Great. Bible says, Day of the Lord come like a thief in the night. Ooh, Babylon, skirt uncovered. But let me not go down there. Let's get to this temple model. Hallelujah. Let's get to this temple model. You see, because right before that day comes, there's going to be a rapture. And the Bible says that the door to heaven is going to be open on that day. Revelation chapter 4. So I want to focus in on this right here. Look at your screen, whatever you're looking at right here. I'm going to focus in on the altar of incense. Okay, so what was the premise of this message? That God doesn't change. And you saw the scripture. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, right? Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change, right? So, I want to focus in on this altar of incense. Okay, because when we focus in on this altar of incense and we build out the evidence... We can start to put the puzzle pieces of the book of Revelation together so that we can see God's model put into place, okay? Because he's the architect. It's like <laughs> you got God as the architect and you got people telling the architect, God, hey, you're not supposed to build it like this. That's what they're saying when they don't properly understand the word of God. Okay, how are you going to tell the architect you're not going to build your temple this way? How are you going to tell the one who has the blueprint, hey, don't build it like that? Or are you going to build it like this? Or are you going to build it like that, but not according to the model? I mean, how arrogant is that? Or how deceived is that? I don't know, but it's terrible. But not on this channel. We're not going to do it like that. We're going to go by what the Bible says. And so let's focus in on the altar of incense and let's start in the Old Testament and then we'll get to the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. Okay, this is all about the tabernacle and the furnishings. And so God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verse 9, Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. God... <clears throat> You know how people say, hey, take a chill pill. <laughs> I had to take a chill pill right there because I was just about to blow up. I mean, because I just get I just get so like, you know, it's just like a it's like a fire shut up in my bones. You just want to explode, you know? <laughs> just want to explode, my goodness. You just want to explode. I just can't I can't explain it. Okay. <laughs> can't explain it. I gotta take a chill pill. My goodness. But look at what the Bible says. I mean, I just don't get it how you can get I don't understand how you could get this confused. That's what I just don't get. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Okay. Let's keep on going. Okay. So I pray that you got that. I mean, just help us, Holy Spirit. Just help me. My goodness. Help me. Exodus 25 at the end. Uh, look what he says in verse 40. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Okay, so make everything according to what God has shown Moses. Okay, and it's a pattern. It's a model. And God says you have to make it exactly. You have to make it exactly. You can't deviate from the blueprint. So, the premise is that the tabernacle that Moses was told to build exactly to the pattern that he was shown, which is this, is going to be set up in the same manner that the earthly model was set up. Speaking about the heavenly reality at the time of the rapture. Okay, so at the time of the rapture, okay, the real deal, the real shebang, <laughs> because God doesn't change, hallelujah. The real shebang, okay, when we put on our immortal bodies, when we go into the presence of God, 
we're going to see the heavenly reality set up the same way. That's the whole point. Okay, that's the whole point. The heavenly reality is going to be set up the same way as the earthly reality was set up. End of discussion because God don't change. Hallelujah. And so, how was it set up? Exodus chapter 40. Hallelujah. Okay. Exodus chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it. And you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. Verse 5 is the key. This is what we're going to focus in on. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. Okay. So right before the screen for the door of the tabernacle is put up, the last item that goes into the tabernacle is the altar of gold for the incense, which is set before the Ark of the Testimony. Okay, so this is the altar of incense. This is the last thing, this is the last furnishing item that is mentioned to be put into the tabernacle before the hanging of the door is put up, meaning the door is going to close. <laughs> okay, the door is going to close. So, knowing how the rapture is going to take place, we understand that when the door to heaven opens, that is when the body of Christ goes into the tabernacle, right? Okay, and so... We know that the body of Christ is the golden candlestick, okay? Jesus Christ made that clear in the book of Revelation. Revelation uh, chapter 1, he gave us the mystery of uh, the golden candlestick, the seven-branch menorah. Revelation chapter 1, uh, the last verse, he tells us the mystery, okay? So, verse 20 of Revelation chapter 1, the mystery of the seven stars which he saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay, so the menorah is uh, the church. Okay, so we know that we are put inside the tabernacle when it is set up in heaven before the altar of incense. Okay, this is because God doesn't change and his word is true uh, yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus Christ is the Word. We see in verse chapter 4 that the menorah is mentioned of Exodus chapter 40. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. Okay, so the lampstand is the seven branch candlestick, the menorah, and you have to light its lamps when it's brought in. That's why we have to have oil. Okay. That's why you have to have oil. You have to have the 390 for the 390. Okay. 390 for the 390. Hallelujah. 390 for the 390. Okay. Got to have oil. Okay. okay Got to have oil. And that's a, uh, that's a non-negotiable. Okay. They say what the terms are. They say what the terms are. Okay. What the terms are. Okay. And the non-negotiable items, got to have oil. Okay, that's a non-negotiable. Okay. <laughs> now, if you want to be a foolish virgin, okay, you want to you wanna try to negotiate. Okay. You want to try to negotiate. Okay. You want to be a foolish virgin, you say, hey, I'm going to negotiate the non-negotiables. Hey, your soul, your destiny. Okay. You want to negotiate the non-negotiables, oh foolish virgin. Okay. And you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to play it cool. I got my jaw oil, but I ain't got no oil. I got my jaw oil, but I ain't got no oil. Ooh, 
I'm going to negotiate the non-negotiables. <laughs> hey, your soul, your destiny, okay? But if you want to be caught up on the cloudy and dark day, okay, you got to have oil. Because the Bible says when the menorah, okay, when the lampstand is put into the tabernacle, the lamps have to be lit. Okay, that's why we have to have oil, because the oil is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the light, because the Holy Spirit is the menorah. Okay, the seven spirits that burn before the throne of God, the seven spirits of God, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of yod heh vav the spirit of the fear of yod heh vav the seven spirits of God is the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit has to be in you. He is the oil. I mean, when he's in you, you are the light of the world. Christ, the hope of glory, is inside of you. Hallelujah. So you have to have him. He is the oil, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And so we see that uh, the seven churches, which are the seven golden candlesticks, and we're part of the church, hallelujah, made up of both Jew and Gentile, we are put in right before the altar of incense is mentioned, okay? We are put in right before the altar of incense is mentioned. So, a rational person, I mean, somebody with some common sense, okay? Okay, somebody that has the Spirit of God, hallelujah. Okay, would, uh, would, upon receiving this information, okay, would likely... I believe, would wonder, well, where do we see, okay, uh, the altar of incense in the book of Revelation? Where do we see the altar of incense in the book of Revelation? Because we have to be inside the temple, okay, as the seven branch menorah before the altar of incense, because when the altar of incense is mentioned in the pattern, according to Exodus chapter 40, the Bible tells us that the door is then shut. Okay. So we want to be inside before the door is shut. So we want to see how everything unfolds to make sure that we have the proper understanding of what's going on in the book of Revelation. And so we see the altar of incense in Revelation chapter 8. Hallelujah. This is the place where we see the altar of incense. And so this goes into another side story but it's really not a side story it's still the main story you hear people always say <laughs> you hear people always say well once you get to revelation chapter 4 okay the church is no longer mentioned which is correct the word church is not mentioned of course hallelujah but the way they take that out and play out their their doctrines is incorrect because the church is still seen throughout the book of Revelation in various different places when you know how to put the puzzle pieces together because that's how God works. Okay. The Bible says God hides things. Okay. Okay. God has put stuff in his word that we have to seek out. Okay. Okay. The glory of God is to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search it out. Okay, God has concealed things. Okay, there's stuff hidden inside his word that through the power of the Holy Spirit, when you seek him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, okay, with all of your strength, when you seek him, when you ask him, okay, when you keep on knocking, when you're persistent, okay, he'll start to reveal what he wants to reveal to you, but you got to be persistent and you have to ask him for the understanding because the spirit of understanding is him. And when you get that spirit of understanding of the concealing, the knowledge and the wisdom to put it all together will, will always follow because it's all him, the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all truth. And so, here in Revelation chapter 8, 
Okay. We see the altar of incense. And so this is another thing. I don't know who's listening. Could be your first time on this channel. You can't read the book of Revelation <clears throat> like you're reading a storybook in chronological order. Okay, like from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, there is a chronological order, okay, in a general sense, because Revelation chapter 22 ends with the new heavens and the new earth, eternity, okay. And it begins, Revelation chapter 1, <laughs> with the times that we are living in right now. And so it's going to a chronological conclusion in a general sense. But you can't read every word, every chapter in chronological order in order to try to make sense of what God is saying. This book of Revelation is a puzzle book. And you have to put the pieces together with the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you to put the pieces together. And this is one of those pieces, Revelation chapter 8, where we see the only mention of the altar of incense. And so with your understanding of Exodus 25 and Exodus chapter 40 and how Moses was instructed to make everything according to the pattern, you would understand when you get to Revelation chapter 8, well, hey, if the altar of incense is mentioned in Revelation chapter 8, well, that must mean that the next event after the altar of incense is mentioned is that the door is closed. Okay. The door is closed. So, and also when you read about the altar of incense, you would say, hey, well, wait a minute. The altar of incense is put in as the last item, but it's all connected to when the tabernacle is set up with uh, the Ark of uh, the Testimony put in first, the Table of Showbread and the Menorah put in, and then the Altar of Incense. It's all connected as one whole event, and then the door is shut. So when you put these pieces together, you will see that Revelation chapter 8, beginning at verse 2, is actually talking about when the door in heaven opens and what's going to happen. Okay. When the tabernacle is set up. Verse 2. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 8. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so let me just talk about this real fast. Remember the mystery of Revelation chapter 1, verse 20? The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. Okay. The seven stars which you saw in my right hand, these are the seven angels who stand before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. Because when you go to Revelation chapter 5, when you see the lamb stand up, okay, he has seven horns. The seven horns are the seven trumpets. Revelation uh, chapter 5, okay, verse 6. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. OK, so these seven horns are the seven trumpets. OK, and the seven horns, which are the seven trumpets, are given to the seven angels who stand before God. Verse two. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. The seven trumpets are the seven horns that the lamb has when he stands up. Okay? And when he stands up, he gives uh, those seven horns uh, to the seven angels who stand before him, which are the seven angels, uh, which are uh, the seven stars in his right hand. Okay? These seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Okay, these seven stars which you saw in my right hand are given the seven trumpets, which are the seven horns in Revelation chapter five. Okay, you got to put all these pieces together. Okay, because in the Old Testament it talks about the hiding of His power. Okay, the hiding of His power when He comes. Okay, let me show that to you. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, Habakkuk. Okay, that's Habakkuk. 
Let me go to Habakkuk. Okay, the hiding of his power. Hallelujah. Let me go to Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 3. Okay, when the Lord stands up. Okay. Let me show this right here. Okay. Uh, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, the prophet on Shigaonath. O Lord, I've heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand and there his power was hidden. Okay, that's the thing. This is, this is, <laughs> this is where the horns are at, okay, which is uh, the seven angels in his hands. Okay, so you got to look at the Hebrew for this word rays. Okay, look at this. Okay, um, right here, uh, this is the Korean. Okay, uh, the Korean is the horn. I don't know why they translated rays. Okay, but the, as you can see, the Hebrew is Korean. Look at it right for yourself. It's a horn. Okay, the Bible tells us in this verse that that's where his power is hidden. Okay, the when he re, when he's revealed, according to Revelation chapter one, the mystery. There's seven stars that are in his right hand, okay, which are the seven angels of the seven churches. Okay, these are the same seven angels that stand before him that are given seven trumpets. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 5 that when the lamb stands up, he has seven horns. Okay, so where do those seven horns go? Well, those seven horns are given to the seven angels who stand before him that are in his right hand, okay, which are the seven angels of the seven churches. Look at it again. Look at this right here. Okay, this is strong 7161. Do your own research. Don't believe a word I say. Okay, do your own research. Don't believe a word I say. Okay, but believe what God says. Okay, okay, this is strong 7161, Corinne. And it means a horn. Okay. A horn is what this word is. A Korean is a horn. Now let's go back to the verse. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 4. Okay, I like the King James Version uh, because the King James rightly has horns. Okay, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. And there was the hiding of his power. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at the verse, hallelujah. This is all talking about the rapture. Okay, Habakkuk chapter 3. It's talking about the rapture, the cloudy and dark day. Okay. His brightness was like the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. And there was the hiding of his power. Okay. Look at it. Okay, these are horns. It's plural. That's why it's Karanim. Okay, it's plural. So it's seven horns, as we see in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, when the Lamb stands up, he has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, so these seven horns, where the prophet Habakkuk tells us, are in his hand, okay, where the hiding of his power is. These seven horns are given to the seven angels who stand before him in Revelation chapter 8. Okay, verse 2, and I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. My goodness. Right there in black and white. <laughs> okay. The seven trumpets are a horn. Okay, it's, a, it's the shofar, the trumpet, the horn. Okay, the Korean. Okay, these seven angels who stand before God are given the seven trumpets, which are the seven horns that the lamb has when he stands up, okay, when everything changes. Okay, look at it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Okay. And this event, <laughs> hallelujah, this is, this is just so amazing. This event where we see him standing up takes place before he takes the seven sealed scroll, 
Okay. Verse seven, then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Okay, this is before he takes the seven sealed scroll and opens it. Okay, so this means that this is an event that happens at the time of the rapture. Okay, because at the time of the rapture, when the lamb stands up and he descends from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, he comes like lightning. You saw how fast lightning comes. Okay, so just like lightning, the Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he's going to come uh, like lightning from east to west. And when he comes like lightning from east to west, the Bible says the door to heaven is going to open and the voice is going to tell us like a trumpet to come up here, which is like the first voice in Revelation chapter one. OK, because the first voice is for the dead in Christ who are going to rise first. OK, the shout. OK, then the voice of the archangel is Michael standing up because there's war in heaven. He's defeated the dragon and cast him down to the earth. This is all supernatural happening faster than we could blink. And then the trumpet of God is for those of us who are alive and remain. And we're all caught up in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? At the last trump. Hallelujah. And then the Bible tells us, like John, immediately. Okay, we're going to be before the throne. Okay, Revelation chapter 4, when he hears that last trump, <laughs> hallelujah, when he hears the last trump, when the door to heaven opens, okay, uh, Revelation chapter 4, he tells us, uh, verse 1, and after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this, and immediately, okay, so it's going to be an immediate event, immediate. Immediate event. Okay, this is all supernatural. It's happened immediately. You have no time to get ready when this event happens. You have to be ready. Okay, you, if you want to negotiate the non-negotiables, well, sorry for you. Okay. You want to negotiate the non-negotiable, sorry for you, foolish virgin. Okay. You didn't want to have a 390 for the 390, well, sorry for you. Okay. You wanted to negotiate the non-negotiables. You didn't want to have a 390 for the 390. Then we'll have it. Okay. You didn't want to have it. You wanted to negotiate the non-negotiables. You said, I don't want to have no 390 for no 390. Well, Bible says when this day comes, it's going to be immediately. Okay, no time to get ready. You got to have oil. Because the lamps to the menorah, have to be lit. Okay, you ain't got no oil, you're not going. Okay. You ain't got no oil, guess what? You're not going. You want to go back to the non-negotiable? You talk about non-negotiables. Okay. I'm going to show you a non-negotiable right now. <laughs> okay, we're talk, we talking about the non-negotiables of the non-negotiables. I want to show you the non-negotiable of the non-negotiables. Okay, now look at this. Okay, this is what we already looked at. I want to show it to you again just to make sure about these non-negotiables. Okay, let's go back to the premise. Okay, you talk about a non-negotiable that was a non-negotiable when it was just him. Hallelujah. For I, the Lord, do not change. My goodness. Okay. When it was just him. Hallelujah. Speak, Holy Spirit. When it was just him. When it was Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when it was just Him. When it was just Him, it was, it's just the Godhead. When it was just Him, I, the Lord, do not change. Okay. When it was just Him, get into the text now. When it was just Him, I, the Lord, do not change. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. So, we either get on his schedule, or you could be a foolish virgin and pay the consequences. We have to have oil on this day. You see, because it's going to be immediate, and when it's immediate, you have to already be ready. Because when the door opens, we know, according to the pattern, 
that Exodus chapter 40, when the door opens, okay, the first thing that's going to be put in is the Ark of the Testimony. Revelation chapter 4, when the door opens, the first thing that John sees when he immediately is caught up in the spirit, he says, and behold, a throne set in heaven. Okay, he's going to, God don't change, it's going according to the pattern. Okay, and so the next, the next item after the throne is mentioned, because God is going to set up the tabernacle in heaven, according to the same pattern that he gave Moses on the mount. So he says, after that, you shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it. So there goes the table of showbread, okay, with the 12 loaves, one loaf for each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, which was the bread of the presence always to be before his face. Okay, and that's a whole nother teaching. No one ever speaks about this. They always leave this out. Okay, I never heard anybody talk about the table of showbread. <laughs> I, I never heard anybody say anything about the table of showbread as far as connected to the rapture. Okay. But this is, my goodness, God don't change. So who is the table of showbread? Okay. Who's the table of showbread? Who is it? Because the table of showbread is so important that it's the next item put into the tabernacle after the very throne of God is mentioned. I'm talking about Bible now. After the very throne of God is mentioned, the Ark of the Covenant, the next item that is put into the tabernacle is the table of showbread. Who is it? Who's the table of showbread? Okay. Hear nobody talking about who the table of showbread is. So after the table of showbread, but connected right with it, the Bible says, and a vav, when you look at the Hebrew, after it describes the table of showbread in Exodus chapter 40, there's a vav that connects the table of showbread with the menorah. Okay, you see it right here in Exodus chapter 40. You shall bring it in the table, talking about the table of showbread, and the things that are to be set in order on it, and that's the vav, and you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. So we already know that without a doubt that the lampstand is the body of Christ, the church. But the mystery is, and it's not a mystery, it's been revealed. Who's the table of showbread? Okay. Because they go in first, connected to the menorah. But I'm not going to get into that teaching right now. I want to get back to this altar of incense. Okay. So the body of Christ, the menorah, here we are. We're inside the tabernacle. And then the Bible tells us that after the lampstand is put in with, and the light is lit for the lamps, that's why you have to have oil. Verse 5 of Exodus chapter 40, you shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. Okay, so there goes the altar of incense, the last thing that's mentioned before the door is shut. So back to Revelation chapter 8. Okay, here we see verse 2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so we're still looking at this same event connected to Revelation chapter 5, when the Lamb stands up, okay, which is connected to Revelation chapter 4, okay, when the door opens, and he comes like lightning, okay, and then when he comes like lightning to get the table of showbread and the menorah, and we are put into uh, the Father's house, because no one comes into the Father except through Jesus Christ, he's at the head, you see it in Daniel chapter 7, when he comes with the clouds of heaven, Okay, and he comes before the Ancient of Days. Okay, that's that scene in Daniel chapter 7 is Revelation chapter 5. Okay, when the Lamb stands up and he takes the seven sealed scroll from the one sitting, sitting on the throne. And so, here we see in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 8, okay, verse 3, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. 
Okay, so there goes the golden altar. Okay, so this is a scene that we're looking at. Okay, this is a scene that we're looking at because we're here already. Okay, we've come like lightning from east to west to appear before the Ancient of Days. And Jesus Christ is at the head. We're the body. Okay, and we're looking at this whole scene take place. Okay, we're looking at this all taking place. Hallelujah. We're looking at this whole event take place, okay, because the altar of incense is mentioned after the menorah. So that means that we as the menorah have to be seeing Revelation chapter 8 happen right before our eyes. Revelation chapter 8, then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Okay, so this is the golden altar, which was before the throne. This is the same language that Moses used in Exodus to describe um, the altar of incense. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony. Okay, same language. God doesn't change. The golden altar, which was before the throne. Hallelujah. And so this angel, <coughs> this angel, who comes to the uh, uh, who comes to the altar with a golden censer? He's given much incense that he should offer with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So we're seeing this event take place. We're seeing this angel. Okay, and I believe this angel is none other than Gabriel. That's a whole nother teaching. I've talked about it before, but I believe that that angel is Gabriel. Okay, because I believe he's also that second angel that we see in Revelation chapter 14 that comes out of the temple with the message that Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And I believe the first angel of Revelation chapter 14, okay, the three angel messages, the first angel is Michael, okay, and he says there's no more time, okay. And then uh, the second angel, Gabriel, I believe he's, uh, the one that is at this altar of incense because that's where he appeared, okay, in the in the New Testament to announce the birth uh, of John to Zacharias. He appeared at the altar of incense where he was serving to announce the birth of John. So I believe it's it's him, okay, because he uh, he was connected to the earthly one when he appeared at the altar of incense to give that message to John or Zechariah, John's father, about his soon coming birth. I believe, just putting the puzzle pieces together, that he's that second angel. And he's the one who announces that Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And we see him right here. <laughs> Hallelujah. We see him right here. Okay. okay. We see him right here offering up all the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And we're looking at it take place. Okay. Cause we're already inside the tabernacle. Okay. Cause this is where the altar of incense is mentioned and going by the model, the pattern that God gave us, the menorah is inside the temple before the altar of incense is mentioned. Okay. So we put two and two together. We're looking at this scene unfold. Okay. But this is at the same time, that the door to heaven is open, okay? Because the door to heaven is not closed, <laughs> okay, hallelujah. The door to heaven is not closed until the smoke fills the room, hallelujah. <laughs> Ooh, it's just so glorious. I mean, and there's so much to say about that, about how the smoke fills the room. You see that in Isaiah chapter six, okay? Where Isaiah is seeing a vision of the rapture and he's already inside, the temple looking at God, okay, he's looking at him. And then when he's looking at him, the Bible says that smoke begins to fill the room. Okay. And so this is the same thing that we see right here in Revelation chapter eight. We begin to see the smoke, verse four, and the smoke of the incense. Okay. Now the smoke's starting to fill the room. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> My goodness. Okay, make it plain, Holy Spirit. Make it plain, Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. Okay, altar of incense, last item. And then guess what? 
Right when we see the last item, we see the smoke. Uh oh. Okay. Uh oh. Well, it's not no uh oh for us because we're already inside. We're safe. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, we're safe. Okay. My goodness, we're safe. But for those left behind, uh oh. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. People left behind. Can you imagine the terror? Can you imagine the terror? All these people just suddenly disappeared. <laughs> okay. All these people just suddenly disappeared. They heard something. I mean, everything. I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't know what it's going to be like for the left behind, but I don't know. But my goodness. Okay. We're, we're inside here. Can you imagine the terror on the altar of burnt offerings, which represents the earth? Can you imagine the terror? Okay. Of the event of the rapture when we just all got snatched. Okay. We got snatched up. Can you imagine the terror? Of everybody left behind, okay, and we got taken immediately, okay, because the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. Uh oh, and then here we are before the throne, looking at uh, this angel coming uh, with a golden censer to the golden altar with much incense, okay, that he's about to offer on the golden altar, which is before the throne, and when he does it. Verse 4, in the smoke of the incense, there goes the smoke. It's about to fill the room. Uh-oh. Okay. And the smoke of the incense. Let me just show you this because God's leading me to show it to you. Okay. I just want to put two and two together. Okay. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Isaiah chapter 6, look at this. Because Isaiah is looking at the same event. Isaiah is looking at the same event. And look at Isaiah. He's inside the temple. Okay, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train of, the, of his robe filled the temple. So he is looking at a vision of the rapture, and he's already in there, and guess what? Verse 4, and the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Hallelujah. It's right there. Okay. The house was filled with smoke. Okay, same thing that we're reading about right here in Revelation chapter 8. Verse 4, we're already inside the temple looking at this event take place. And verse 4 says the smoke is beginning to fill the temple. Okay, uh-oh. <laughs> I keep on saying uh-oh because I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible day for those left behind when the smoke starts to fill the room because you ain't inside the room, uh-oh. You ain't inside the room. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Okay. You ain't inside the room. Uh oh. You ain't in the land very far off. Uh oh. You ain't seeing the king in all of his glory before the smoke fills the room. Uh oh. My goodness. Okay. Verse 4 And the smoke of the incense. With the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Hallelujah. And then we get the whole shebang. Verse 5. Now this is where I want you to do your own study. I want you to do your own study about this. And I pray you do the study about everything else that's been said. But verse 5. I want you to take a look at this and do it for yourself. And let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Pray for a teachable spirit, Holy Spirit. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Hallelujah. Okay, so this is the same event of Isaiah chapter 6. Okay. Isaiah sees the Lord in all of his glory and he's already inside the temple when the house begins to fill with smoke and then he confesses that he is undone he's coming undone at the seams he's like literally disintegrating he believes because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts verse 6 here's the key then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a live coal which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. Okay, so the same event is happening. 
okay, in Isaiah's vision that is happening in Revelation chapter 8, only this time the fire from the altar, which is the coal, is judgment that's going to be raining down upon everybody left behind. Okay, because Isaiah was saved. He was saved. Okay, he was saved uh, from this judgment of live coals falling upon him, whereas the live coal that he uh, was given touched his lips. Okay, it wasn't uh, it wasn't cast upon him. It was given to his lips by an angel, and when that live coal that the angel, the seraphim, had taken from the altar of incense touched Isaiah's mouth. The seraphim says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Hallelujah. Whereas at the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ at the time of the rapture, when all of us are in the father's house that are either the table of showbread or the menorah. OK, we're all inside the father's house, safe and sound. And we're looking at this event of Revelation 8 take place because the door is still open. And then the altar of incense is mentioned. Hallelujah. When the smoke starts to ascend before God, the smoke is going to start filling the room. And so now when the smoke starts to fill the room, there's going to be a judgment poured out upon the earth. Okay. Because what happens? The Bible says the angel take the censer. He fills it with fire from the altar, hailstones and coals of fire. And he throws it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Now look at every time you see these events. Okay, you see the fire from the altar is the hailstones. Okay, and then you see noises, you see thunderings, you see lightnings, and an earthquake. You see these five elements in uh, Revelation chapter 16, okay, verse 18, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Okay, so there it goes. Okay, that's why you can't read the book of Revelation chronologically. Okay, this is uh, Revelation chapter 8 <laughs> right here that we just read. That's Revelation chapter 8, same event. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So that goes with uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 18 through 21, same event. Then you see the same event in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. Okay, you can't, that's why you can't read everything chronologically, because God has concealed things in his entire word. And now it's the glory of kings, the honor of kings to search it out. Okay, it's the honor of kings to search it out. It's the glory of God to conceal it. But when you put the puzzle pieces together, you can start to see the same uh, picture just from a different perspective, which is what John is seeing. He's seeing the same event, but he's just seeing it from a different perspective, just like Isaiah. OK, way back 2,700 plus years ago, he saw this before the book of Revelation was even written. By John, OK, before John was ever conceived by his mother, he saw this event in Isaiah chapter six, and he recorded it from his perspective. Okay, from a different perspective, but it's the same event that he's describing. Okay, before the book of Revelation was ever even written, this is the same event. Okay, from a different perspective. Same thing that we're looking at in the book of Revelation. So we see it in Revelation eleven nineteen, Revelation 16, 18 through 21, uh, Revelation 8, uh, verse 5, where we see, the thunderings, the lightnings, the noises, the earthquake, and the hail. And we also see it in Revelation chapter 4. Only in Revelation chapter 4, we don't see the hailstones and the earthquake because this represents the place of safety 
for those of us who are inside. Okay? Because once we're inside, okay, once we're inside, when the door opens, verse 5 tells us, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Okay, so there's no mention of the hailstones and the earthquake because we're not being shaken. We're not being destroyed by hailstones. Okay, we're safe. That's why the next thing that we read about is there are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, the Holy Spirit that indwells the seven churches. It's the menorah. Okay, there's no mention of an earthquake and hail right here in Revelation chapter 4 because we're safe. But it does mention the lightnings, the thunderings, and the voices which come from the throne. Okay, which is God's judgment. Hallelujah. Okay, because those thunders are the seven thunders that you read about <laughs> in Revelation chapter 10. And in Psalm 29, uh, that come upon everybody left behind. Okay. And then we see uh, also in Revelation chapter 15, okay, we see the temple in heaven opening again, which is the same event from a different perspective. And we see the seven angels who stand before God coming out. Okay, the same seven angels that we see in Revelation chapter 8 verse 2 that stand before God. The seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets, which are the Korean that Jesus has. When he stands up, because he has seven eyes and seven horns, those seven horns are where the hiding of his power is at, according to Habakkuk, because in his right hand are the seven angels, because they stand before him. Okay, the seven angels who stand before God, Jesus is God. Revelation chapter 1 tells us that the seven angels are uh, the seven stars in his right hand. Hallelujah. And in his right hand, that's where the hiding of his power is at, according to Habakkuk chapter 3. Okay. Let me just show you this again because I forgot to read the next verse. Because at the next verse of Habakkuk chapter 3, we get uh, the hailstones. Okay. Habakkuk chapter 3. Hallelujah. I pray that you're uh, understanding all this, and I pray that God is revealing his message to you because it's glorious. Habakkuk chapter 3, we see... Uh, verse 4, his brightness was like the light. He had horns uh, from his hand, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence. Okay. <laughs> okay, before him uh, went pestilence. I like the King James, because the King James, it doesn't change these words. Okay. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. Okay, there goes the hailstones. Darkness is under his feet. Okay. Darkness is under his feet. And guess what? On the cloudy and dark day, those hailstones are raining down because darkness is under his feet. He stood up. Okay? He stood up to get us because he had to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. He stands up. And under his feet is darkness. And the Bible tells us uh, from his feet there's coals of fire. Verse 6 of Habakkuk chapter Three, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. Okay. This is the same thing that we just read in Revelation uh, chapter 16. Okay. When every island floods away and all the mountains are not found, everything is shaking. It's the greatest earthquake in human history. Okay, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as not had occurred since men were on the earth. Okay, now just think for a minute. This is the Creator coming for judgment, and He comes like a thief in the night. Okay, this is the Creator of everything that's coming. You think people are not going to shake? I mean, uh, it's the apocalypse, and I just don't understand what people be thinking. People say it's a silent rapture. Nothing silent about it. Okay, nothing silent, nothing secret about it. You just got to be ready for it, okay? Because if you get left behind, well, you're going to shake, okay? The Bible says it's the greatest earthquake in human history. It's God who's coming. 
resurrection, okay? God who's coming, okay? It's, it's the one who made everything. You think he can't make everything shake? You don't think he can make every island flee away and all the mountains bow down? Okay, you don't think he can make this whole world into a desolate place and rearrange everything while killing one-fourth of all the population and sparing those who he wants to spare alive to go into the time of Jacob's trouble? You don't think God could do that? My goodness. Okay, you don't think God, he says, the nations are like a drop in the bucket to him. He counts it as a very little thing. Okay? This, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is nothing for God. I mean, come on. You don't think he could rearrange this whole planet without even thinking about it? Okay? This is all his work. It's his strange work, he says. Okay? Everything is going to be totally desolated. Okay? Greatest earthquake in human history. And the Bible says one-fourth of all the world will die. Okay, from all the effects. Okay, hailstones. Okay. Every weight, every stone about the weight of a talent. That's about 100 pounds. Okay, all those hailstones, 100 pounds each. Okay. And Babylon will be judged. Double destruction. This is what we see. This is, this is, this is Bible. And so let me just go back to Revelation chapter 15, and then we'll end it. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Okay, so this is the same thing as Revelation chapter 4 when the door opens. Verse 6, and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. This is what we read in Revelation chapter 8. Okay, when they get these seven plagues, those are the seven trumpets that are given to them clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So not only do they have the seven trumpets given to them by God, okay, because he stands up, he has seven horns. Revelation chapter 5, so the seven horns are given by God himself, Jesus. But as the seven angels who stand before him are leaving the tabernacle once they go out, okay, because the door is still open. Once they go out, okay, as they go out, these seven angels who stand before God, the Bible says one of the four living creatures, which are on the uh, uh, east, west, north, south uh, of the throne, okay, one of those four living creatures give each of the seven angels a golden bowl full of wrath. Okay, so not only do they have the seven trumpets, they also have the seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And verse 8 is the key. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. Okay, so there goes the smoke filling the temple again. Right after the seven angels leave, which is Revelation chapter 8. Because remember, Revelation chapter 8, okay, they have the seven trumpets. Okay, and so... Right after the temple, uh, right after uh, the seven angels who are given the seven trumpets in Revelation chapter 8, right after we read that in verse 2, we see the, the altar of incense ceremony where the angel takes the fire from the altar and throws it to the earth and there's noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Well, then we see the seven angels who stand before God, who have the seven trumpets, they prepare themselves to sound, and the first four trumpets sound. Okay. The first four trumpets sound, and the first trumpet, okay, this is just total devastation. Okay. Just read these trumpets. These first four trumpets are sounding uh, right when the dark and cloudy day begins. Okay, the first four trumpets are sounding right when the dark and cloudy day begins, because the second trumpet is the destruction of Babylon. This is Babylon the Great being totally destroyed. Okay. This is Babylon the Great being totally destroyed. Okay. This second trumpet is Babylon the Great all on fire, totally destroyed. Okay. That's why I said you get left behind in America, you're dead. Okay. The third trumpet is, is, is the enemy coming down. Okay. Another name for Wormwood is, is Satan's name. Okay, this is this is the enemy coming down. He's that great star being cast down. And then you see 
a third of the other fallen angels coming down because a third of the heavens are darkened. Okay, so this is all the dark and cloudy day. Okay, and then you see the first uh, trumpet is uh, the fire. Okay, the hailstones. Okay, the hail and the fire that's coming down. Okay, every stone about the weight of a talent. Dark and cloudy day. You don't want to be alive to see it on the earth. Okay. You don't want to be alive to see it on the earth. You want to get the heavenly perspective of, from the rapture. Okay. Because Revelation chapter 15, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Which brings you back to Isaiah chapter 6. Okay. I believe that these two witnesses are coming out. Okay, these two witnesses. I'm probably going to do another video after this. Uh, later this week, Lord willing. About these two witnesses again. Because uh, I saw something that I want to share again. But needless to say, I believe this is a vision of the commission of the two witnesses. Okay, because after this live coal is touching uh, Isaiah's lips, okay, but in uh, uh, from the book of Revelation, when these live coals are mentioned as being poured out upon everybody left behind on the earth, but then God asked the question, okay, verse 8, and also... I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Okay, so after the dark and cloudy day has begun. Okay. <laughs> after the dark and cloudy day has begun. Okay. <laughs> after the dark and cloudy day has started. Okay. <laughs> when the whole world is flipped upside down. Okay. Whole world turned upside down the man of sin will be revealed okay the sinister minister and so when he when he appears he's going to sign a covenant with many for one week and so right when he signs that covenant begins the countdown so here comes god with uh the chess move okay because he has two witnesses that he's going to sin. And so he asks everybody in heaven. He asks everybody who's in here. <laughs> he asks everybody who's in here. Hallelujah. Okay. He asks everybody who's in here. Just like he asked Isaiah. As the, as the vision shows us. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Okay. Who want to go back? <laughs> who want to go back? Who want to go back? Okay. Who want to go back? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who want to go back now? <laughs> Dark and cloudy day. Okay. Dressed in sackcloth. Thousand two hundred and sixty days. Oh. Who want to go back now? <laughs> Hallelujah. Isaiah said, what did he say? Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. I believe this is going to happen. I believe this is going to happen. And God's going to ask the question, who wants to go back? And like Sister Grace Sue said, it could be one of the priestly duties. Okay. Could be one of the priestly assignments. Because I'll just say it right now. Revelation chapter 11. It tells us that the two witnesses are connected to the church. Okay. The two witnesses are, are, are somebody from the, from the church. Because the Bible says in Revelation uh, chapter 11, when he describes the two witnesses, these are the two olive trees. You got to have oil. They have the oil. See the same thing in Zechariah. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Well, what's the lampstand? Revelation chapter 1 gave us the mystery. Okay, Revelation chapter 1 told us the mystery of the lampstand. The lampstand, okay, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay, so the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Well, the two witnesses, okay, in the description, 
These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. So the two witnesses come from the church. Okay, the two witnesses are connected. There are two lampstands. The, the lampstand is the church. Okay. The lampstand is the church. So these two witnesses, they come from the church. It's right there. Look at the look at the description. Let God be true and every man a liar. Okay, they have oil because they're the olive tree, <laughs> which is where the oil comes from. And they're uh, part of the church because they're the two lampstands. Okay, they come from the lampstands. They, and the seven lampstand is the menorah. Okay, they come from the church. Okay, so the church is in heaven, caught up. Isaiah chapter 6, smoke fills the room, altar of incense, hailstone judgment upon the earth, greatest earthquake in human history, releasing of the seven uh, sealed scroll, okay, destruction of Babylon the Great, order out of chaos, Antichrist is arising, who knows how long that period of time is going to take, but then at a moment in time, he's going to usher in some type of false peace. And the moment he signs that covenant of death, that covenant of hell with many for seven years, for a week. The Bible says the moment he starts that covenant of death begins the countdown. So right when that countdown begins, okay, the two olive trees and the two candlesticks have to go and meet him face to face. <laughs> The two olive trees and the two lampstands, okay, standing before the God of the earth, have to go back and meet him. Okay, dressed in sackcloth, thousand two hundred and sixty days. Okay, Isaiah chapter 6. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Okay. After the smoke fills the room, okay. All of us are safe and sound, new bodies, immortal. <laughs> okay, who won't go back now? Who want to go back? That's the question. I believe it's going to happen. Who's going to answer? Only God knows. Maranatha. Amen.